All right, good morning. Flow measurement ILM 310302H. So this is introduction to flow measurement, precursor to the next series of ILMs uh, in third year measurement. Uh, let's see what it holds for us. All right, objectives today, state the purpose of flow measurement. Pretty straightforward there, I think. Compare mass flow and volumetric flow, not too bad. Uh, describe the regulatory standards and the governing bodies responsible for flow measurement. Probably familiar with some of that already. Principles and applications of meter proving. Uh, again, there's usually quite a high number of students in the class that have had some experience with uh, meter proving. And then last objective, sketch a loop diagram illustrating the basic components of a proving measurement system. So it's a very gener generic type of drawing. So all good uh, background information as we move into flow measurement here. Okay, so what is flow measurement? Uh, flow measurement is the expression used to describe the flow or flow rate of a material. And is generally, generally stated as a unit of mass or volume over time. Uh, as you see in this course coming up, we're going to be using many different flow transmitter technologies in order to measure liquids, gases, and solids. And that leads us into why. Why do we measure flow? So there's lots of different reasons that we measure flow. We're focusing on four specific ones in this ILM. First one is custody transfer, uh, which is the exchange of basically the exchange of goods for money, in my paraphrasing. Uh, this includes pipelines, distribution networks, uh, things like your gas meter at home, your water meter at home. Uh, we're trading money for, for something, and that's what we call custody transfer. Second purpose is used in production. Um, Dustin's probably aware of this. He's out in the field right now, but we use flow measurement for uh, reporting oil and gas production and accounting. Uh, and it's guided in Alberta by something uh, called Directive 17 by the Alberta Energy Regulator. And we'll talk a lot more about Directive 17 this year as well as again next year. So I encourage you to kind of become familiar with Directive 17. So custody transfers, first purpose, second purpose is production. Third purpose here is uh, safety. Um, we often use flow transmitters as uh, leak detection devices. So the ILM uh, gives an example of using leak detection on, on a pipeline um, where we have a couple of different meters uh, that get summed together and they should total this meter. And if there's a discrepancy, that means either something has been lost or introduced into the system. So a good way to use a flow meter as, as leak detection. I've also seen um, flow meters or flow switches used on uh, seals on some pumps with a purge gas and if the seal lets go, then the purge gas um, starts to flow and that sets off a flow switch. So there's uh, different applications in terms of safety. Last application that we're specifically talking about for flow measurement is process control. Uh, we often use this to set production rates in a facility, for example. Um, great example uh, from the ILM here is the fuel and airflow that are uh, used on a furnace. Uh, critical flow measurements that we use for process control to adjust for efficiency and pollution control, a um, major component of this year's uh, curriculum. So that was objective one, getting us into what is flow measurement and what's the purposes of flow measurement. Uh, objective two here takes us into the difference between uh, mass flow and volumetric flow, and it's a very elemental uh, difference, uh, and we'll talk about them specifically. Um, but here's a little table that gives us the different types of units that we look at as we're comparing mass flow to volume flow. And you can see there's applicable units for solids, liquids, and gases, but the common denominator here, mass flow rate, uh, you see kilograms or pounds, um, mass units, whereas in the volumetric flow rate here, you see meters cubed or liters or gallons or cubic feet, which are all volume. Uh, measurements. So that's one easy way to tell what we're talking about is by the units that we're using uh, to express uh, the rate. Okay, uh, flow rate of solids is mass based and the flow rate of liquid, uh, fluids is volume based. And it's kind of at this point in the course where we uh, kind of redefine this word fluid. And fluid really uh, now forward means anything that 
flows basically. So we're going to include gas and liquid uh, as fluids uh, and solids remain uh, the same. And it has largely to do with compressibility. Okay, so uh, here a little bit more detailed look at mass flow versus volumetric flow. So when mass flow rate stated, it's clearly defined. Um, it's clearly defined because we know the density of it. So we know how much it actually weighs or the mass of it. So uh, if mass flow or QM states the amount of matter per unit time, uh, example, 10,000 kilograms per minute. Volumetric flow, uh, QV, uh, indicates the volume per unit of time, such as 10,000 cubic meters per minute or hour or whatever it might be, 10,000 meters a minute is pretty fast. Okay, uh, with volumetric flow, uh, here's the key difference here. Fluid densities will change with both pressure and temperature and also compressibility. Um, because liquids are not very compressible, we usually only concern ourselves uh, with the temperature component. But when we're talking about gases, uh, the effect of temperature and pressure and comp compressibility are all significant. So that's kind of the difference between uh, liquids and gases, which we both still call fluids. Um, in order to determine the mass flow, we then have to take the volumetric flow rate and multiply it by the fluid's density. And that's the big kicker right there is the only big difference between mass flow and volume flow is that density component. And the density component, again, depending on the medium, uh, is affected by at least uh, temperature, but also could be affected by pressure and compressibility. So you should understand the difference between a solid, liquid, and a gas in that regard. Okay, flow measurements are generally taken at flowing conditions and use uh, these basic formulas here. So uh, QM or mass flow is the volumetric at flowing conditions times the density at flowing conditions. Mass flow, uh, again, in this formula is the volume at flowing conditions times the density at flowing conditions. So uh, not, complicated, uh, not complicated math here. Uh, these little variables here, sometimes you'll see uh, an S here, so you'll see uh, flowing um, volumetric at, at flowing conditions or an S for standard conditions, and that's something to look out for as we move ahead here as well. So here's an example uh, of what you might have to do in terms of math, calculate the mass flow given the flowing volume of 0.2 cubed meters per hour. Uh, flowing density at 0.13 kilograms per meter cubed, and we can plunk those into our formula here, 0.2 times 1.30, or 0 0.130, sorry, it gives us 0 0.026 kilograms per hour as our mass flow rate derived from our volumetric flow. So it's not uh, too tricky. Okay, calculating density, which again is our key pivot point here when we're talking about the difference between volumetric flow and mass flow. And it has to do with the density uh, between solids, liquids, and gases. So let's have another quick look at that. Okay, with solids, density only changes with temperature. As a solid heats up, it volumes expands, thus the density goes down. There's the uh, same amount of stuff in a bigger space, so the density goes down. Very minor, uh, and we generally ignore this when we're doing solid flow measurements. So solid flow is just the volume times the density that uh, the, that median has. For liquids, uh, density changes with temperature and pressure. Okay, density increases with increasing pressure. So think you're squeezing, uh, you're squeezing something uh, smaller. So you have the same amount of stuff in a smaller space. So density is increasing, and it just like solids decreases with increasing temperature. The temperature causes it to expand. Thus, we have more space, thus decreasing uh, the density. The purer a liquid is, the less it's affected by pressure, meaning if it doesn't have air bubbles and, and different uh, density components within it. Water, for example, is fairly incompressible. Uh, liquid propane gas and raw oil, for example, are way more compressible. Um, that being said, they are still uh, way less compressible than a gas is. Okay, gas density. Uh, greatly affected by pressure, temperature, and compressibility. And you may have remembered some calculations I think Tacomi did in second year involving uh, Z, uh, which was a compressibility factor. And we touch on it quickly 
in some of the math here, but it's just theoretical and we don't actually perform any of it. So don't get too worried about that. Um, as such, though, it makes it more complicated to calculate. But again, um, we'll show you how. There is uh, one question on this in the back, but it's uh, not, not as tricky as you probably remember from second year. It's an abbreviated formula. Okay, so here's that formula off page 13. So density of flowing uh, conditions. And we plunk it into the formula here. Here's our compressibility factor, that Z uh, of flowing conditions. We have a constant RT. Uh, R, the constant is RT is the temperature of flowing conditions. M is the molar mass of the uh, medium and then the intensity of flowing conditions. So we don't uh, we don't use this a lot, but it's a relatively straightforward formula. Uh, here's an example of what it's gonna look like. Calculate the density given methane uh, at 15 degrees Celsius and 700 kPa is 5.935 kilograms per meter cubed. And atmospheric pressure is 100 kPa's. So what is, what is the density given these variables and we can plunk uh, we can plunk them in here so our pressure at flowing conditions is a combination of uh, the two pressures here the density which is I guess I should have included it in the question here is um, calculated but it would be given in the question typically and then here's our compressibility factor our gas constant and our temperature in Kelvin remember very important to convert Celsius to Kelvin, and this gives us a new uh, number based on those conditions. Okay, so we talked about flowing conditions, and that's great. Things flow all over the place all the time, and we measure them at flowing conditions. But when we're uh, we're talking about trade and doing business in different areas of the country or the world, we have to make sure that everything is fair and to do this we have produced something called standard conditions different bodies will have different values for what they consider to be standard conditions but when we're talking about trade uh, or custody transfer we have to agree on on what these standards are uh, in order to do this we will use different correction factors in different areas to convert flowing conditions into standard conditions in Canada, for example, our standard conditions are 101.325 kPa's and 15 degrees Celsius. The reason that these standards matter is because if we know um, the medium that we're dealing with and we know the uh, pressure and temperature, we then can know the density. And that allows us to be able to sell a particular mass uh, of, a, of a product and this is kind of like the chip bag story where the bag's got all this volume but there's a certain amount of chips in there and as long as it's all documented we're pretty good with it okay there's uh, a couple of equations to go along with this here uh, volumetric flow at standard conditions here I told you earlier you may see this little s uh, so this represents standard conditions uh, is flowing conditions times density at standard divided by density of flowing uh, for any flow, meaning solid or liquid. And then when we're talking about uh, converting volumetric uh, flow at standard conditions uh, or getting standard conditions from flowing conditions, we have the additional um, variables of uh, temperature and compressibility in there for gas, again, because gas has those uh, characteristics that have to be accounted for. Okay, using uh, using one of these formulas here, uh, the flow rate of the gas is 28 meters cubed at 75 degrees Celsius and 1155 kPa's at this given barometric pressure in my local area. Calculate the flow uh, rate at base conditions or standard conditions. Ignore compressibility in this case. So a little bit of a mean question, or is it nice? I guess I don't know. Uh, but taking the compressibility factor out of there, um, we can multiply our volume uh, flowing conditions, which is 28.54 times our density. And again, not given uh, our sorry, not our density, our pressure at flowing conditions here, um, which is uh, this number here plus this number here on top divided by our uh, standard atmospheric pressure, pressure standard, 
multiplied by our temperature standard, which is 15 plus 273, divided by our temperature of flowing conditions, which is 75 plus 273.15. And we run that through the old calculating machine uh, to get a new um, flow, volumetric flow at standard conditions of 291.8 meters cubed or per hour. And you'll see how um, increasing the pressure um, allows us to get a lot more material in there, obviously. So that's that objective. Next objective moves into uh, regulatory standards. I, I hope that was, I know, a little quick maybe for the difference between volumetric and, and um, mass flow, but um, really, again, it's just a matter of compensating for that density and being aware of the variables that affect density uh, in a particular medium. So moving to regulatory standards here, uh, flow measurement for process control, uh, generally not regulated uh, in the process control application. However, there are standards that are followed by industry and they're usually site specific. Um, some companies will follow things like ISO, which is a, a common one that just kind of says, you know, we, we hold ourselves to a higher level, but it's not really mandated. Uh, but when it comes to trade production environmental applications, the government does uh, usually have a vested interest in how things are operated. So we'll talk about the different agencies that kind of look after some of the things uh, that we might be concerned about in our trade. Okay, uh, AER. Uh, big one, uh, provincially here, the Alberta uh, Energy Resources, uh, used to be called the ERCB, uh, it's now the AER. Um, they look after all the oil and gas uh, stuff, compliance, inspections, utility rights, all that kind of wonderful stuff on a, on a provincial level. Uh, National Energy Board, um, anything that crosses borders, whether it's within Canada or internationally, uh, is looked after by the National Energy Board. Um, there's other people that are interested, but these are the these are the main ones that uh, we're concerned with when we're talking about things like uh, pipelines, for example. The National Energy Board is is something that's going to be involved, uh, and when we're extracting oil, gas, for example, um, we're talking about the AER or the former ERCB. Federal legislation. They generally look after all trade measurement. Um, measurement Canada is the uh, arm of the federal government that looks after uh, trade measurement. So again, when we're talking about custody transfer here, um, Measurement Canada is kind of the uh, governing body that we have to answer to. Uh, they're also concerned with production data and measurement. Again, um, we're talking about natural resources, uh, tax base and all that kind of stuff. So the government wants to be involved. Uh, environmental emissions measurement, of course, carbon capture and CO2 and um, other hot topics uh, of the day back uh, 15 years ago, it was acid rain, but we've moved on now to carbon and carbon dioxide. So again, uh, major concerns. So the uh, federal government kind of uh, has to have its hand in that. Trade measurement, again, govern, governed by the federal government and Measurement Canada uh, is in place to ensure that we all trade on a fair scale. They use the Weights and Measures Act and the Electricity and Gas Inspection Act. These are the two that we are uh, most considered uh, or concerned with as uh, our trade goes. Um, our calibrations of measuring devices, of course, will be, all be mandated uh, somehow by this agency. Okay, devices that we use in the field uh, was, must also be certified by the governing body, in this case, Measurement Canada. Production data, we mentioned the National Energy Board earlier. Uh, they're an independent federal agency that's established to regulate international and interprovincial inter aspects of the oil, gas, and electricity uh, industry. Uh, often these major resources will cross borders, so that is why they are involved. The purpose of the NEB is to regulate pipelines, energy development, and trade in the Canadian public interest. They're looking out for you and me, don't you know? They are accountable to Parliament through the Minister of Natural Resources, who's probably an actor or something like that. I'm not sure. Emissions measurement, uh, Environment Canada, 
should be probably familiar uh, with that agency uh, via the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, supervises areas like toxic emissions, pollution concerns, and waste handling uh, in regards to oceans and, and different waterways. So federal government looks after uh, most of the big picture items. Provincial regulations, a um, little bit less uh, concerned with the big, big picture and more concerned about uh, resources and money. Uh, so when it comes to flow regulations for production reporting and environmental monitoring, uh, the province is generally in control of their own resources, so, so they look after that. This is set out uh, through the AER, uh, who sets out the requirements for flow reporting when we're dealing with our own resources. Uh, and they do this using Directive 17. Uh, again, I encourage you to learn as much as you can about Directive 17 because it does reappear again in fourth year. So a little bit about Directive 17 without getting too heavy into it here, um, but it, it will uh, specify what and how to measure volumes, what, where, and how to estimate volumes, which accounting procedures to perform, uh, what data must be kept for audits and reporting, uh, and the resulting volumes that you must report to the AER. So you can see that these are all uh, interested in um, monitoring uh, who's getting our resources and uh, ultimately who's paying for them and who's taking care of the, the damages afterwards. K Alberta Environment also plays a hand uh, in environmental measurements to ensure that we're responsible, of course, when dealing with the environment. Uh, a couple of different acts that are uh, addressed in the ILM here include the Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act, which deals with pollutants, and of course, the Climate Change and Emissions Management Act, which deals with uh, greenhouse gases. So again, lots of different uh, agencies, the federal level, uh, as well as the provincial level, uh, a far few uh, here at the municipal level. So uh, municipally, meaning within your uh, city or town, uh, such as Red Deer, for example, they basically look after things like water. Uh, so the water meter, for example, will be something that your municipality uh, will look at and they'll have maybe some regulations in place regarding that. So that covers the legislation uh, portion of the ILM or the regulation portion of the ILM. And the next chunk, uh, a pretty significant chunk here, talks about uh, meter proving. So here's a great big uh, meter prover. This is called a ball prover. Um, just to put it in perspective, and I ask every class uh, that I have or that I have had in person, has anyone ever worked at a facility that looks familiar to this? Uh, and the reason that I ask is that many years ago, I worked somewhere by Ram Falls or I, somewhere in Alberta here, uh, very similar facility to this. They had this big ball prover on site. It looked a lot like this. Uh, for context, there's a, it looks like about a 50 ton crane in the background. So I don't know if anyone recognizes that facility or not, but I'm, Anyway, so this is a ball prover, um, pretty big machine right here. This is something that we're going to talk about today uh, in meter proving. So proving a meter, uh, what is it? It is a procedure that is used to ensure that a measuring device is accurate and traceable back to a known standard, especially important in custody transfer applications. And we spend a lot of time talking about custody transfer. Okay, proving is done uh, based on the operating principle of the meter, at least in terms of this ILM. So we'll look at a section that deals with meters with moving parts, uh, meters with no moving parts, and differential uh, flow meters. So we'll look at uh, what's involved in proving. Okay, moving parts type meters. Uh, these will include turbine meters and positive displacement meters. So again, um, easy enough to identify if you're familiar with these types of meters. Um, you recognize that they do have moving parts, obviously turbine spin, uh, positive displacement meters usually move back and forth in some way or rotate in some way. When we're proving this type of meter, uh, we are ultimately going to be deriving what's called a meter factor uh, from the prover that is applied to the meter in question. But the reason that we're doing this is to correct for any variables that happen, uh, such as internal wear inside these meters. They have moving parts, so they do wear out, which means that dimensions are gonna change, uh, there's gonna be leakage, et cetera. 
Uh, so the purpose of proving is to verify these meters against something that's more accurate and determining what the error is going to be. We know there's probably going to be one. Uh, and so we correct that uh, using something called a, a meter factor, which is just a factor we apply uh, to this meter in order to make it uh, measure more accurately. And this is usually done monthly or annually or semi-annually on some type of a schedule. Okay, next up is non-moving uh, parts type of meters. Uh, these will include things like vortex meters, mag meters, ultrasonic and Coriolis meters. Uh, we'll discuss all of these different types of flow meters uh, in this section on flow measurement, uh, not today, but through the next few weeks. Okay, because they have new moving parts, they do not wear out. A meter factor may be used to compensate for installation and fluid properties, but as a general rule, it should never change. They generally check themselves through a function called meter verification, which is a internal electronic verification of the meter's function. And basically what this uh, meter verification does for you is it just compares uh, electronic measurements that it had from the last time the process was done uh, to the measurements that it gets this time when you uh, run the process. And if there's any differences in the electrical measurements, uh, it, it will call for uh, calibration. But if those measurements are within a tolerance, well, it says, okay, I'm, I'm good for another uh, extended period of time. So you don't have to prove it uh, as often. But it's not really a physical calibration procedure. Okay, last uh, type of application for uh, proving methods here is differential flow meters, widely used for measuring flow uh, in many different uh, industries. Uh, and they measure, of course, differential pressure across some form of an obstruction, usually an orifice plate. Uh, and if we're using an orifice plate in, in particular here, uh, the square root of the mass flow is proportional to the differential pressure that's measured by the transmitter. Um, but again, uh, there are other uh, elements, and we'll learn more about those also this year. Uh, because this method is independent, uh, sorry, is dependent on the transmitter, uh, the orifice, and the piping, uh, it's a little bit more unique when it comes to proving. So there's a lot more variables here. The transmitter comes into play, the piping comes into play, um, the orifice itself comes into play. So orifices can wear out. Uh, you probably don't think that they do, but they do. Um, so there are some variables that we have to consider, and that's why differential pressure uh, proving is a little bit unique, and we'll address that here. Okay, in custody transfer applications, the meter is proved by verifying the orifice and piping measurements and the differential pressure, static pressure, and temperature calibrations of the MVT. Now, this comes out of left field because we've never mentioned MVTs before. Um, most of you are probably aware what an MVT is. Uh, MVT stands for a multivariable transmitter, and that is essentially a transmitter that will measure the differential pressure, static pressure, and temperature at the same time. Now, a modern Rosemount 3051, for example, can do all of these things at once. Uh, back when I was your age, we used to have, um, they just came out with uh, multivariable transmitters that would have a, a built-in differential and static pressure sensor and then a remote thermocouple that ran to a different port uh, on, on the piping. Um, now they're, they're more or less all, all combined into one kind of handy dandy unit. But anyway, what we're talking about here is uh, compensating for not only the physical changes that could happen uh, in terms of the orifice and the piping, um, but also the calibration things that we have to do when we're talking about temperature and pressure. So field proving, uh, something that we commonly do. Um, this is a process where the output of the tested meter is compared to the prover at base conditions. And if necessary, a meter factor is assigned to the meter. This is a standard process, um, and it's it's a relatively simple simple process. We have our everyday meter uh, that we measure our flow with here, uh, and it runs every day, and we take its numbers as accurate on a daily basis. But every once in a while, uh, we have to run it through uh, a prover, uh, and this is mounted in the field here, and it's. Uh, isolated by block and bleed valves here. And basically what happens is you close the block valve, divert the flow through the prover. Uh, it measures here. It also measures here. We compare these numbers. If they match, 
we're happy. If they don't match, we divide one, one number by the other number. It gives us a meter factor. We punch that meter factor into our daily device and magic alicadabra, uh, the numbers all then, then match. So uh, here's, here's, that. Uh, here's that in long uh, wordy terms here. How do we determine a meter factor? We first determine the indicated volume, so what it's showing on our daily meter. Uh, we then determine the corrected meter volume. Then we determine the corrected prover volume. And then from that, we divide one from the other. We get the meter factor, and then we apply it. So it's not a terribly tricky process. Okay, I'll walk through the steps quickly here of uh, one, two, and three, I believe here. How do we determine uh, these things here? Indicated volume of meter is at flowing conditions. Uh, the formula looks like this, indicated volume. Uh, the meter is the number of pulses divided by the K factor. So not uh, nothing fancy here in terms of variables. Uh, an example here, uh, if the meter on test generates 10,565 pulses during a proving run, and its K factor, uh, which will be given on a tag on the device, is 2,800 and 2.52 pulses per meter cubed, then the indicated volume of the meter is going to be 3.7698 meters cubed. How do we know that? Well, we know how many pulses we've measured on the run. We know how many pulses it takes for every cubic meter, so we divide the two numbers together, and it tells us that we get 3.7698 meters cubed. It's pretty straightforward. Corrected meter volume, also pretty much uh, similar calculation here. The indicated volume of the meter is also at flowing conditions. We apply correction factors uh, so that we get compatibility again across the industry. Um, the factors are found in tables that we don't use. So a little dance. Formula looks like this. Um, indicated volume conditions here and uh, temperature at line conditions, pressure at line conditions. Uh, gives us our indicated standard volume. It's wonderful, um, but I don't believe um, we have to do this. I'm drawing a blank on whether or not we perform this or not. But if we do, uh, you'll see that it's not it's not too bad here. Okay, corrected prover volume. Uh, again, the indicated volume of the prover is at flowing conditions, so we have to apply correction factors uh, to ensure that the comparability again is across industry and all our standards meet regulations as outlined by some legislation somewhere. Uh, so some of the factors uh, that we have to uh, compensate for, uh, the correction temperature of the liquid, the correction pressure of the liquid, the correction temperature of the steel, meaning the, the pipe, uh, the correction pressure uh, of the steel, again, meaning the piping system. So this gives us our um, calculation, uh, taking our base volume, multiplying it by all the different correction factors here in order to get our corrected prover uh, volume. So exercises in theory is basically what we're, we're doing here, ultimately getting us up to the point where we end up coming up with the meter factor. So to get the meter factor, uh, we take all the previous steps that we've uh, done, and then we take that gross standard volume that we just calculated, divide it by the meters, indicate a standard volume, and then we get our meter factor. And that's about six pages of the ILM. Um, that's a little bit more painful, in my opinion, than it needs to be. Um, but a step-by-step -step process that gets us to the point where we get the meter factor, which is ultimately the number that we're going to put into our transmitter in order to make it read accurately. Whew, big breath. All right, um, moving on. I think this is another objective. Let me just check here. Not quite yet another objective, so uh, prover types. So we already mentioned that provers are used to verify the accuracy of our daily meter, uh, and as such, it must be traceable, going back a couple of ILMs there. Uh, provers are verified by labs using two methods. Uh, the first one is uh, a volumetric method, meaning measuring the volume. It's usually done through a process called water draw. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details on that. There's a couple paragraphs in the ILM, but they're basically uh, sucking out a known volume 
um, of, of a liquid and then putting it in another container that's accurately measures that volume and then they compare them. Uh, that's the first way. And then the second way is called gravimetric, which means that they basically uh, measure the weight uh, of the fluid. So one of them is done on volume and one of them is done on weight. Those are the two main differentiations uh, between Kruger types. All of them, regardless of what physical property uh, they use, mass or volume, uh, the standards are calibrated against the national standard, and we talked about that uh, in previous lectures. So let's look at some liquid and gas prover types, uh, starting out with liquid provers. Okay, the ones we're going to look at today are uh, bidirectional pipe provers. That was a big picture we saw when we started the lecture. Uh, or not the start of the lecture, but the start of the section. Uh, the second type is a small volume piston, and it uh, looks just like it sounds. Uh, the third and fourth one, uh, tank provers. Uh, there are tanks. We'll talk about those. And then master meters, which is mentioned a lot, but not really talked about uh, too in depth. So the first one here is a conventional pipe prover, sometimes called a ball prover. Uh, this is a diagram that's not in your ILM that shows basically that image uh, of the facility that I showed with this great big giant thing. Uh, and this is the prover. It's like 12, 16, 18 inch pipe. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big piece of equipment. So we'll talk about this and, and how it works. Okay, the first thing to know about this um, in terms of applications um, is that the flow is not interrupted during the proving and it's done at operating conditions. We basically are just diverting the flow uh, of, the, of the flowing process at line conditions. Okay, temperature and pressure readings uh, are taken to correct the base volume. Uh, the base volume is calibrated and of course traceable to an acceptable standard by some master meter which is certified. Uh, or a water draw, which means that we again fill some calibrated container. Um, so again, this is all going back to traceability. Uh, master meters are required to be calibrated either by uh, Measurement Canada or a facility that has been listed in Measurement Canada's legislation. If you've got too much time on your hands, you can look up a look in G16. I would probably not encourage you to do that. It's very large. Um, but again, um, the, the prover is again on site to verify our daily transmitter um, but this has to answer to a higher power as well uh, and that's what this base volume talks about uh, once it's done it shouldn't change um, but there will be uh, checks that have, have to be done uh, occasionally okay the volume uh, specifically must provide a minimum of 10,000 pulses this is an important number here as you see moving forward here uh, 10,000 pulses is going to come up many, many, many times. And the reason it's 10,000 pulses is because by having this many pulses, it increases our resolution. And by increasing our resolution, we can get a better accuracy number here. Every zero we take off of the pulses moves the zero this way in terms of accuracy. So more pulses equals more accuracy. And 10,000 is kind of the, the golden number. Okay, here we have a video that shows it all in action, and this is usually when things go south for us, but let's see if this happens to work out. Stop sharing this PowerPoint. Maybe. I'm working on it here. All right. Uh... The calibration of meters under actual operating conditions is the key to accurate measurement. One of the most widely used provers is a bi-directional sphere type displacement prover, which is used. One of the I'm assuming you cannot see anything yet at this point. Okay. No, you cannot see anything. All right. There should be a video now. Yeah. 
You got enough. Widely used Proopers is a bidirectional sphere type displacement prover, which is used to calibrate all types of meters. Positive displacement, turbine, Coriolis, and ultrasonic. All displacement provers operate on the principle of a calibrated volume between two detector switches, which is directly traceable to a metrology standard. In this animation, we see a Smith positive displacement meter, shown in red, upstream of a bidirectional sphere type displacement prover. In normal operation, the fluid flow, depicted by blue arrows, only flows through the meter. To prove the meter, the flow is directed through the prover by opening the valves upstream and downstream of the prover and closing the valve in the main line downstream of the meter. These valves are typically block and bleed valves, which provide a means of positively checking that there is no leakage through the valve and that all the flow has been directed through the prover. After the flow is completely diverted through the prover, the four-way valve is actuated, which reverses the flow through the prover. This launches a sphere in the forward direction through the prover bore. Focusing our attention on the meter, we see the pulse stream from the transmitter on the meter being fed into the pulse counter. Each of these pulses from the meter represents a small volume of fluid that has passed through the meter. As the sphere contacts the first detector switch, the pulse counter starts counting the number of pulses received from the meter. When the sphere contacts the second detector switch, the pulse counter is stopped. Since this is a bidirectional prover, once the prover pass is completed, the four-way valve is reversed and the sphere is launched in the reverse direction. The pulse counter is once again activated by the first detector switch and stopped by the second. This cycle is repeated a set number of times, and the results are used to verify the repeatability of the meter. The totalized pulses on the counter represent the precise fluid volume that has passed through the meter during the respective prover passes. This indicated volume is then checked against the prover volume between the detector switches, which is accurately calibrated to a known standard. The meter's indicated volume can then be adjusted to equal this precise volume by means of a meter factor. After the proofing session is complete, the three block valves are reversed, so flow is no longer diverted through the prover, allowing normal meter operation to resume. All right, we back to the slideshow now? Yes. Perfect. So good video. Uh, probably could have showed that and knocked 10 slides off of this presentation. I think that was a pretty good video. Told you lots of pretty key points about these bidirectional pipe provers. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, moving on to the next type here now is a small volume um, piston prover. I'm not going to go into as much detail as the ILM uh, does on this one here. Um, hit, the, hit the high points here. They are used for smaller volumes, uh, quite a bit smaller volumes. Uh, they are more accurate. And they have this particular benefit uh, of being able to count, count pulse fractions using something called double chronometry, which is a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of word that you probably want to familiar yourself, uh, familiarize yourself with. And what double chronometry basically means is just like the bidirectional uh, ball prover uh, that we just looked at, it has it basically it has two sensors which allows us to count um, half strokes. Um, and basically, what that does is allows us to use uh, resolution lower than the ten thousand pulses that are that are usually required. So we'll have to look quick here at uh, double chronometry. Chronometry, boy, that's a mouthful chronometry i'm going to give up on that one but basically you see it's got a, a sensor here and a sensor here each sensor uh generates a pulse and there's a little bit of a difference between the two pulses so basically what that enables it to do is to be able to uh, count half pulses uh essentially then it's 
there's more to it than that in the ILM, but that's uh, that's the high point of it. Okay, volumetric tank provers. Uh, some of you may have experienced some of these driving onto site. Uh, we'll look at a volumetric tank prover here, and then we'll look at a gravimetric tank prover. But these are generally uh, service companies that will come out to site uh, where you don't have a bidirectional ball prover or uh, a piston uh, style prover uh, built in, uh, and you have to have someone come from somewhere else to to your proving for you. Uh, so the first one here is a volumetric tank prover. Not going to get again into the details too much, but again the difference between volumetric and gravimetric is that this is a known volume. So they know what this volume is here, uh, as long as they can verify the amount of volume that this piece of pipe here takes up. They do a little bit of math, uh, and then they can uh, do a measurement uh, through here to, to compare this volume with this volume in order to do uh, the proof. The second way of doing it, uh, very similar, except this is gravimetric. And gravimetric, again, is weight-based. So you'll have a tanker truck that will have been uh, weighed uh, with its uh, load of whatever fluid that happens to be uh, in there. And they will uh, pump that through the system, and they'll compare the, the masses between the two uh, measurements and prove the meter that way. So uh, just generally hitting on, uh, again, the difference between volumetric and gravimetric. So summary here uh, about tank provers. The problem with these ones here is that flow is interrupted. And maybe I'll just go back here. Uh, you'll notice that I can't, I can't have flow going both ways, or this is not going to be representative of what's going through the pipe. It will be split. So I have to close this block valve in either situation. So this means that the flow is interrupted during improving, which is probably, I don't know, maybe less desirable than the other one, but far less expensive. Um, the base volume must be calibrated uh, and traceable. So again, uh, when it's coming in by truck, there's potential for temperature and pressure changes. So it uh, has to be calibrated uh, and traceable. And that's not your problem. Generally, it's the service company that um, brings the prover to site that has to worry about that. Uh, the weight measurement also must be uh, traceable. Okay, last but not least here, master meters. Um, look at look, just uh, a lot more simple version here. Master meters used to serve as a reference for proving other meters. The master meters are secondary standards, meaning, meaning that we can use them to calibrate our normal daily meter. And master meters are used when it's not practical to use a prover. Most master meters are either a positive displacement or turbine meter. I think that's all we say about master meters. Oh, one more thing. These are also done at flowing conditions, as you see here, diverting the flow, so no interruption. So the flowing conditions, so we don't have to worry about compensating for anything. So a lot of general information on uh, four different types of liquid uh, provers. We're now going to do a similar process for uh, gas proving devices. Um, two are the same, two are different. So let's have a look here. Uh, gas provers include bell provers, the first one we're going to talk about. Don't worry, you'll never use one. Uh, master meters, which are the same as we just saw. Uh, sonic nozzles, which are new, and tank provers, which are amazingly similar to the ones we just looked at. So let's have a look first at bell provers. Here's some primitive uh, images I pulled out of the archives that show a bell prover uh, in their different kind of configurations here. But essentially what's happening here is you have this uh, upside down vessel, which we call the bell. And when we raise it, it fills with a certain volume uh, of a gas. When we then push that gas down over top of this mechanism here, it forces uh, the water here, forces the gas out, and then we can measure that and we know the volume of this. So that's kind of a low down and dirty description of a bell prover. Bell provers are used for calibrating master meters. They are very low pressure, like atmospheric pressure basically, and very low volumes, like limited to the physical size uh, of this machine here. So this is a, you know, maybe a better representation of what's going on compared to my uh, antique pictures. But again, the bell lifts up, 
fills with the gas, you lower the gas uh, filled vessel into there. Of course, the gas is not nowhere to go, so it gets forced through the piping system. Okay, uh, there's a picture of one in real life. So you'll see used in a laboratory, not likely that you're going to uh, end up dealing with one of these. Uh, the bell, of course, has a precise volume and as it's lowered into the liquid, the gas is displaced and forced through the meter being tested. Main purpose for these is to calibrate master meters. So you take your one from your facility and you send it away to these guys and they use this to calibrate your master meter. Next up, master meters. Again, usually a positive displacement meter such as a turbine uh, or a turbine meter, uh, usually calibrated against the bell prover as we saw uh, earlier. Uh, and by doing this, we can then in turn do higher flow rates and pressures using these different uh, devices that were calibrated uh, against the bell prover. Next up, sonic nozzle provers. Uh, this little section actually got smaller uh, during the revision of the ILM here. Uh, this is kind of what they look like. I used to have a picture that I like better in here, but basically the idea behind this mechanism here, and there's a cutaway version of it, basically what they're saying here is um, when you have the velocity of a gas at the speed of sound, only so much of it can fit through here. And there's some fancy math that they can do to prove that, um, and they have, and as such, they design them so that different size nozzles will allow an amount uh, of flow through it. And by using a certain combination of these, we can simulate uh, different flows uh, to use for proving. I hope that simplifies what you guys have to read. Here's some scary math for you. Okay, so this is talking about the math behind these critical flow nozzles here, and it goes on to say that flow at sonic velocities through a nozzle or a flow tube produces a fixed repeatable flow rate, meaning that you can only jam through much, so much stuff through that hole. The flow rate is a function of the upstream temperature, upstream pressure, and the specific gravity of the fluid. And of course, there's all kinds of variables in there to prove that that's a true thing. That's all we're going to say about critical flow nozzles. Okay, tank provers. Uh, again, we talked about these uh, a little bit earlier. Um, it's a new addition to the ILM and long story short, if we know the volume of the tank and it's traceable, we can then calculate the values uh, if we also know the temperature uh, and pressure. So that's no major elaboration uh, there because we have talked about different types of tanks uh, and, and tank proving and they're all very, very similar. Uh, similar. Okay, moving now to, I believe, let me just double check my ILM. Bringing it all together, so the whole system, page 39. So the system uh, consists of the meter on the test, so our daily meter, uh, other input measurements such as temperature and pressure, uh, any computer systems that are associated uh, and classified as electronic flow measurements. So whether you're dealing with like a flow boss, uh, for example, that's got its own little built-in computer system that does uh, calculations and thing like, things like that, or whether you're connected into a, a PLC or a DCS system, it's all kind of uh, it's all kind of part and parcel when we're talking about um, electronic flow measurement. Um, and we look at um, not just the electronic por portions of it, um, but also a bunch of mechanical components uh, that are uh, in place as well. So uh, things like the valve A, uh, the air eliminator B, a strainer C, uh, straight lengths of pipe. Here we have our, our flow transmitter. Uh, here we have, uh, this is our primary measurement, right? The flow is a primary measurement. And then we have pressure and temperature, uh, which are secondary measurements used to determine density. And if we have a uh, flow transmitter here and we also have pressure and temperature, well, then we can measure volumetric flow. We can also, through the computer, measure mass flow. Um, different uh, mechanical components, uh, block bleed vent systems, uh, analyzers, sample ports, all kinds of different things that are uh, included in the whole uh, proving, uh, proving system. So a lot of information in this introduction to flow. Um, I think lots of it you've probably experienced in life already if you've been working for a few years. Um, but that's the background as, as we move forward. And that is, I believe, the end of this presentation. So I hope I still have 
uh, most of you on board. The end. <laughs>